Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is the first Sunday after Easter, which means that on this day, not quite 2,000 years ago, Jesus appeared to his disciples as a group for the second time. He had showed himself to them as a group on the evening of Easter Sunday. But as we just read in our Gospel lesson, Thomas had not been there with them. Not only this, but then, when the disciples came to Thomas and told him that they had seen the risen Lord, he did not believe them. But instead, he made what he believed was an impossible demand, in saying he would only believe if he was able to see and feel the hand, the, the holes in Jesus' hand and side. But what Thomas didn't know was that in saying this, he was simply outlining the way in which Jesus would prove to him that he had indeed arisen from the dead. We hear again the words of our gospel lesson for today from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And please rise as we hear these words again in Jesus' name. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you, will hold, if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples went and told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hand the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Knowing and believing aren't the same thing. If you know something, then you have either seen evidence for it yourself, or you have arrived at the conclusion of what you know on the basis of logic and reason. Knowing isn't bad, knowledge isn't bad, because we use it in practically everything we do in life. But the thing is, with all that people know nowadays, no one knows how to have their sins forgiven and attain eternal life. Again, knowledge isn't bad, and we shouldn't feel bad for using our God-given intellect and reason. It's just that, again, knowing and believing are not the same thing. This is because, to quote Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then the author to the Hebrews gives us an example. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And this is a simple enough distinction to understand, I suppose. If we know something, then we have seen evidence for it. Whereas if we have taken someone's word for it, then we have believed them. And I think you'll admit that we believe people all the time. We don't know everything. For example, if your spouse or parent tells you something, you're probably going to believe them. Because even if they don't give you proof for what they're telling you, they, in and of themselves, are the proof for what they're telling you. Because by your experience, you have known them to be a reliable, trustworthy person. 
And this kind of belief isn't hard for us. In fact, when it comes to mundane, day-to-day -day things, this kind of believing is actually pretty easy. What is hard, though, is when we are told something that is not ordinary. For example, if we're told that someone has come back from the dead after being dead for a couple of days, we're not going to believe the person telling us, even if it is our closest, most trusted friend. We aren't necessarily going to blow up in their face over how stupid they are for telling us this, but our trust in that person is overcome in a situation like this by our trust in ourselves. And not just in ourselves, but in our own intellectual ability to decide for ourselves and on our own what is true and what can't be true. And if someone tells you something that seems to be impossible to you, there are only two reasons why you would end up believing them. Either you are given some new evidence which is able to change your perception of what can or cannot be true, or some other force from outside of you comes to you and makes your doubts go away and makes you believe. So, where am I going with this? We are all doubters just like Thomas. We are all programmed from birth to doubt anything we are told by God or man if it does not line up and mesh with what we understand to be possible or true in this life. Not only is this sort of belief hard for us, but it's actually impossible. Because none of us are able to actually or fully believe in something if the evidence that we have tells us that the opposite is true. Now what this means for us, especially in our relation to God's word, is that on our own, we cannot fully believe it or embrace it. Because think about the kind of stuff that God tells us in the Bible. How has he arranged for and accomplished our salvation? He did this by causing his son to be born of a virgin as the one God-man. And how has God given us the assurance that our sins have been paid for by Christ? He did this by causing Jesus to be raised back from the dead, even though many, many people had seen him dead and dying with their own two eyes. Thomas the disciple had believed that Jesus was the eternal Son of God made flesh. He believed this because Jesus had told him this and had then confirmed these words with the miracles he had performed. This was why Thomas gave, but, but to Thomas, the resurrection seemed impossible because Thomas had seen Jesus suffer and die on the cross. He knew Jesus was dead. And it was this knowledge of Jesus' death that made Thomas unable to believe the news of the resurrection. To Thomas, it seemed impossible that Jesus could now be alive because he had seen Jesus die. It was only when Jesus came back to Thomas and showed himself to him that he was able to then believe in the resurrection. And when Jesus came to Thomas, Thomas believed instantly and fully because Jesus, God, came to Thomas and overcame his doubts and unbelief and gave him faith in him and the resurrection. None of us, too, just like Thomas, could have believed in Jesus if God had not come to us, too. None of us can get the forgiveness of our sins or hope to get to heaven someday on our own. Just as we needed Jesus to come and be our Savior from sin and death, so also we need God to come to us and help us believe in the gospel and be saved by it. To believe, we need God to come to us, just like he came to Thomas, and overcome our own doubtful, proof-obsessed unbelief so that we can believe in Jesus, our Savior. Thomas believed in Jesus when Jesus came to him and then allowed Thomas to inspect his body so that Thomas could know without a doubt that, yes, this was Jesus and he had risen from the dead. But the thing is, Jesus didn't tout the way in which Thomas came to belief as the most blessed um, ideal situation because he came to belief after having rejected the message of the resurrection. Instead, to, Jesus, to Thomas and the other disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. 
Jesus knew that he wasn't going to be around forever. At least not in how the disciples could perceive him like they saw him after the resurrection. Because of this, Jesus has arranged for us to be brought to faith and saved in a different, yet still entirely divine way. And this method, or this, this plan by Jesus, is laid out for us in our epistle lesson for today. In these verses, John tells us that everyone whom God has made to be, re- made to be reborn has been made victorious over the devil and the world. And the substance of this victory is our faith itself. Now this faith is not something that we have to go out and find or make for ourselves or anything like that. John continues in these verses, and I am paraphrasing here, those who have overcome the world are those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And we who believe in Jesus as the Son of God have been brought to this saving faith and understanding as a result of those things which testify or tell us about Jesus. And these are the water of holy baptism, Jesus' blood and his body in holy communion, and the Holy Spirit working through the word of God. John continues that these are the three agents of testimony that through work, these are the three agents of testimony and conversion through which God brings us to faith, because these are the three agents which agree both as to their message and their purpose. Now what we call these agents are the means of grace, because these are the three vehicles or means through which God works to overcome our doubts by the evidence of Jesus and the resurrection and all that he has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection. And now in our epistle lesson, John concludes that whoever does believe in Jesus has in himself the testimony of God. But whoever does not believe the testimony of God concerning his son has decided that God is a liar. Now, a few weeks ago, if you were to turn on the TV or the radio, you might have seen some people up at the conference downtown giving you their testimony about one thing or another. I want you to realize that I'm not giving you my testimony right now. And whenever you share your faith with someone else, you're not giving them your testimony either. Whenever anyone shares the gospel of Christ, they are sharing God's testimony. They're sharing God's word, through which God works to overcome our doubts and give us faith and assurance in Jesus. So if I'm having a conversation with someone, And I tell them, for example, that Jesus rose from the dead to prove that our sins had been paid for. And they reply with something along the lines of, I can't believe it. I'm not really going to argue with them, not on that point. Instead, I'll agree with them. I'll say, I am glad that you have come to this important realization. Of course you cannot believe this on your own. And you know what? Neither can I. Because of sin and doubt, none of us are able to believe divine truths without the divinely given ability to do so. Unbelief is a natural part of the sinful human condition. If God had left us untouched by him and his gospel, none of us would believe. It is only because God has touched us and has shown himself to us in the gospel that we can believe in him and be saved. So earlier I said that knowing and believing are not the same thing. And they are, at least not in how they come about. But for we who believe as Christians, we do not distinguish between what we know and what we believe. We know certain things. We know that we're sitting here in church. We know that the paper in the hymnals was originally made out of trees. But we also know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We know that he died on the cross in our place. And we know that he rose from the dead as proof that our sins had been paid for. And we know that for Jesus' sake, our sins are forgiven and we're promised eternal life in heaven. We know the things we believe just as much, more so even, than the things which we just know. And think about what's more important for us in the long run. Those things which we know on our own or those things which we have been made aware of by faith. For example, by faith, we know that everything that we know and touch and experience in this life 
came into existence in an entirely unknowable way. That God simply made things come into being by speaking them into existence. And by this same faith, we are divinely sure that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, along with all that this means for us and for our present and eternal benefit. Now this divine surety is something which is important to all of us all the time, but it can seem especially important to us at times in our lives when it seems like the only hope we have is the hope for the life to come. For example, think about Job, the person who spoke the words of our Old Testament lesson. Job had a pretty rough life. In order to prove to the devil that Job's faith in God and the promise of the Messiah was stronger than anything the devil could do to him, God allowed the devil to temporarily ruin Job's life. Job lost his family. He lost his home, his cattle, his money, his health. Job lost everything. And yet, God was right. Job's faith was stronger. Stronger than anything the devil or this world could throw at him. It was on the basis of this faith and the strength and peace that Job received from it that he was able to speak the words of our Old Testament lesson. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job lived thousands of years before Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, and then rose from the dead. But he believed in these things in the same way that we do. Because Job had been taught these things that he believed by God just as we have. By the promise of the coming Messiah. The Messiah Jesus who has now come. And who has and always will give us peace and forgiveness and assurance of faith that he lives. And because he lives, one day so will we and all who have believed in him. We close with the words of a hymn. By faith we are divinely sure that grace to us is given. No human effort can secure this precious gift from heaven. Tis God himself who must begin the blessed work of faith within and lead us to the Savior. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue with the offering.